Behold the Toad. Sapo Grande, the Colorado River Toad, also known as Bufo alvarius. This toad contains 5-MeO-DMT, the world's most powerful psychedelic substance known to man. Welcome back to Fox Medicine Talks. This is going to be a very special edition. I'll be including photos and video of these toads in their natural habitat. And I'm going to take you on a guided tour through desert landscapes, back to the very nature of what it means to be a human. Whether you like psychedelics or not, there's something in this presentation for everyone. And I'm so excited to share with you what I learned from these magical creatures. I first met them in the summer of 2017 in the Sonoran Desert outside of Tucson. And they forever changed my life. In this presentation, we will discuss the toads themselves, their habitat. We're going to talk about 5-MeO-DMT and the effects that it has on the human body and the psyche. I'll be sharing about my experience as a medicine practitioner and what I learned from traveling the country and working with hundreds of clients. And I want to talk about why I decided to retire and what I'm going to be doing now. So without further ado, welcome to 5-MeO DMT and the psychedelic toad of the Sonoran Desert. First of all, I want to give a disclaimer. I would say that I'm not your average guy. I have worn many hats, tried a lot of different things in my life. I have never been a father or been married, and that has allowed me some freedom to do some wild stuff. <laughs> going down to the desert and harvesting toad medicine being one of them. I'm not here to promote psychedelics or to say it's the answer. I think that psychedelics can actually do a lot of harm sometimes. So with that being said, this presentation contains my personal views, my opinions, and please take it with a grain of salt. All right, so imagine a puddle. It's shallow and it's filled with tadpoles. They're in different stages of growth. It's been dry and really hot and that puddle is shrinking. It's a race against time. A huge monsoon rain starts to brew and it comes in and just dumps torrential rain on this little puddle and turns it into a raging river of whitewater rapids and scatters that whole tribe of tadpoles. So there's one tadpole that's all alone. And although he's never seen any of his friends do it, this urge to emerge has him suddenly crawling onto dry land, taking his first breath. And as he hops for the first time, I'm there with a the camera to capture a photo. I wonder if this little toadlet has any clue power that he holds inside and will this little toad find his tribe again and it also makes me wonder what's our medicine as humans it isn't easy being a medicine man in native cultures the medicine man is always sort of on the edge a part of the circle but on the outside of it and I can relate to that. Um, the work I was doing took me on a journey of discovery that led to Port Townsend, Washington, where plant medicines are decriminalized. And I had a chance to really explore those realms with other people in a w way that had a lot of freedom. And I'm grateful to all the friends that I made out there. We're in the midst of a psychedelic renaissance right now where there's legislation being passed People are more accepting of the benefits that can be received through psychedelic therapy, through expanding consciousness and mindfulness. People realize now that with these medicines, we can take a glimpse into other realms. We can heal traumas. We can see what's hidden underneath the surface. We can have extrasensory perception. Can have out-of-body experiences even. 
expand our consciousness. We can connect with our spirit guides. A lot of people want to know what my background is in psychedelic research. What kind of training do I have? I think I had a shamanic calling from the get-go. I remember being a, a kid and tuned into energy, being really fascinated with altered states of consciousness, with spinning until I would get so dizzy I would fall over, making ourselves faint. Uh, dreams blew my mind when I was just a little one. Well, I'd say at the age of 13, I got into psilocybin and mushrooms and LSD, and then that just opened the door to other things. So I've got 30 years now of psychedelic science under my belt, experimenting on myself first, and then others as well. Mushrooms led me to mycology. I've grown all kinds of strains of mushrooms, studied microdosing. I have done extensive amounts of psilocybin. I've done macro dosing, trained all the way up to a 30 gram journey. Must have been 2009 or 10. Um, I was living in Minneapolis, living a corporate lifestyle, really focused on making money. But I started to grow some mushrooms and I had a spiritual awakening I think a lot of people would call it kundalini rising. It turned into an out-of-body experience and it blew me open and my whole life changed. I wasn't ready for it and my priorities shifted. I eventually did a bicycle tour down the Mississippi River and then I came up here to the Northwoods and started living in this community close to nature, much more simple lifestyle. It's like three months away from the school to do a sabbatical and I lived in this tiny cabin out on Franklin Lake. I had two guys that were like my dad's age that had a number of symptoms of different disease stuff going on in their body and their minds and they uh, wanted to experience psilocybin and see if it would help them in their healing. So I was growing mushrooms and then the intention was to work with them and to guide them into that relationship sit with them when they did their journeys um, it didn't work well to say the least it was kind of a disaster and I grew a lot of mushrooms but I wasn't good at guiding yet but during that time I was gifted some acacia confucia root bark powder and I had done the chemistry research and extracted the DMT out of it turned it into a smokable crystal form and I had a a pile of it and I started to do a lot of journeys so um, I was listened to all of Terrence McKenna's lectures I probably smoked DMT 500 times now I have to talk myself into it every time even though I've done it that many times still to this day there's like this deep awe or reverence that like I have to build myself up in order to take that tote <laughs> um yeah and then the drinkable DMT ayahuasca I while I was in the Pacific Northwest I had the honor of assisting a Shipibo trained curandero with weekend plant meditation retreats so I have a bunch of experience drinking ayahuasca and toad medicine I uh this is coming up on eight years since I met the toads this summer so I have a tremendous amount of experience using 5-MeO from the toad as well as the synthetic version which we'll talk about later. Mm. And I trained here at the school with the Healing Nature Center as a trail guide and doing breath work, connecting people with grounding, mindfulness exercises, and nature-based therapy. In addition, I've had the pleasure of learning with some elders in the native life ways the Toltec Wisdom, Zen, and the Celtic Healing Arts. So this is some of my background and my training, and I'll tell you how I got involved into guiding. First of all, that experience with trying to share mushrooms with people uh, left a bad taste in my mouth. And When I got done with that long sabbatical and doing all of the DMT out there, when I returned here, I was sober. 
I decided I was going to take a long break from doing any kind of medicines. And I wanted to experiment with reaching altered states of consciousness through breath work and meditation. I was doing all kinds of Toltec training at the time and guardian training. And I built a coffin that I was putting myself in and doing breath work and recapitulation exercises. Um, and I had a friend that was living at the Zen Center in Madison at the time. So I got to telling him about my DMT experiences and asking him about non-duality and altered states of consciousness that he may have experienced through doing breath work and meditation. He told me about the toads, which I had heard of before. I'd gotten a hold of Ken Nelson or Albert Most's um, book that he had published in 1983. This is just a little like 50 page pamphlet that was on the internet for a while. Anyways, he told me he wanted to go to the desert and see if he could find these toads. And I was game. I said, I'll come. So we went there together the first year. We did find some toads. Brought back the medicine. I had an extremely mild first experience, a tiny amount. And the second time I did it, I had my partner at the time with me. We went to my favorite place in the woods and I journeyed first and I think I put 88 milligrams in this pipe and took the big toke and blasted off. It was a whiteout like experience and all I really remembered was looking over and seeing eyes and my head and her head came together, our foreheads touched. And all I saw was these eyes in front of me, and there was no me, no her, just beauty. And as my ego clicked back in, I realized that it was her eyes, and I was a fox, and that was my my lover. I just had this overwhelming rush of gratitude and heart-opening energy and just exploded. And I felt so lucky to be alive, and it was literally heaven. And then it was her turn and I served her an amount that ended up being too much. She had a really challenging experience, traumatic I might even say. I was shocked and did not know how to help her. And that's really where I started wanting to guide. I was like, I want to be better at this. I want the world to know how good I just felt. Like. And I never want to see someone go through that much pain again. My father, after he, he retired, he became depressed. And the doctors put him on an SSRI antidepressant called Celexa. It was a week and a half into that new medication that he hung himself and committed suicide. And, um, I blamed Big Pharma initially in my grieving process. That was my... You know, if he hadn't taken that medication, he wouldn't have done it. If he would have just ate some mushrooms and went in the woods with me or t took a hit of the toad, he would have remembered how beautiful life is. All these shoulda, coulda, wouldas in my brain and the negotiating and the grief. I see grief work and psychedelics, especially 5-MeO, to be very similar in that there has to be a surrender in order to get to that place of acceptance. Um, and as tragic as my father's suicide is, it's turned into medicine for me now. Uh, it's something I wanna share with the world. And doing the psychedelic therapy stuff really helped me to process it all. It got me in touch with my spirit beyond this body. I know that life goes on after this incarnation and i was able to communicate with him in different ways during journeys it helped me to release the anger that i felt inside about it the hurt it definitely helped me also to to rewire this critical dad voice in my head that was always mm, mean and wanting more.
<clears throat> so this is how I got into guiding. I started with my family and friends, really, just practicing, sharing. It was quite a while before I moved into actually offering uh, sessions with people that I had recently met. It still blows my mind that there's a toad down in the desert that can produce this substance. And when we smoke it, our lives can change profoundly. I've always wanted to protect my teachers. The toads have been great teachers to me. I've also had amazing men in my life that I've learned with and matriarchs. The last thing that I ever wanted was to get in trouble for having toad medicine, which is illegal. It's a schedule one. Um, affect some of my teachers through guilt by association. Much of this time I've kept my lips zipped, been very careful how I navigated these realms. I also didn't want the toads to have more pressure on them than they already do. For instance, I could tell you now how to harvest the secretions in a sustainable way. And some of you might be able to go down and do that, but the reality is some people are going to go down there and not care as much as we do, and they're going to hurt toads, probably hurt themselves. The Sonoran Desert is a big, dangerous place. With the border between the U.S. and Mexico running down the center, this area is notorious for criminal activity, drug trafficking and cartels, as well as illegal immigration. Border Patrol has beefed up security and has checkpoints all over the desert, as well as officers patrolling for suspicious activity. I've been pulled over on two occasions. The homeless population in Tucson is out of control. There are drug addicts all over the city and it does not feel safe anymore. Scorching summer sunshine often makes the temperatures rise above 100 degrees Fahrenheit and everything in the desert wants to burn you, bite you, sting you, and poison you. There are countless species of cactus on the desert floor and spiders and scorpions, and gila monsters, and rattlesnakes. The monsoon storms come out of nowhere, and lightning strikes can cause forest fires, huge rainfalls, wash out roads, flash floods, leave motorists stuck. In addition to all of this, 5-MeO is an illegal Schedule One substance, and it's dangerous business. So I've chosen to censor myself on this topic in a lot of ways. God knows at times I've wanted to scream it from the tops of mountains how amazing 5-MeO is. And sometimes I have. But it's been my best interest to be very quiet about this topic. However, the culture around psychedelics is changing. I realize that by sharing this story and what I've learned that I can actually protect the toads. And I feel like I owe that to them. I bought a P950 Nikon camera one summer before doing a three month uh, biology field research study on them. I also used an iPhone with an underwater case. I captured images and videos of everything from slow-mo tadpoles to the mating, I came upon toad sex parties basically and captured images of the whole process. The male will lock on to the female, it's called amplexus. It's fascinating how tight they can grip on. Uh, and the female will produce a strand of eggs that comes out in clumps while the male fertilizes them from above. And when enough of the clump has come out, then they swim off to another area and the strand stretches out. And pretty soon this mating pond, the whole bottom is just filled with long strands. They're clear gelatin um, strands filled with black pearl beads, which are the eggs. And that's quite a sight to behold. 
takes the eggs 36 hours to hatch approximately. And it's a race against the predators. Birds will come into the water for sure and want to eat the eggs or the tadpoles. Woods themselves have predators, skunks, raccoons. Um, that's the reason for these glands. The paratoid glands behind their neck have the most amount of the secretion in them and they're porous the milky white substance comes out when the creature is stressed let's say a dog wants to attack a toad gets it in its mouth that gland is going to release the secretion the dog's going to get it in his mouth chances are likely that the toad will be able to survive and get away and most of the time the dog will survive too Sometimes it's led to death, apparently, in some canines and other creatures. I think these animals actually get a buzz off of it like we do, in a sense, though. I met a lot of old heads down there that have lived in the desert for 50 years, and they have reported that dogs will repeatedly go back to these toads, you know, over and over again, and mouth them and not kill them intentionally, and then they just lay out and nap around in a trance uh, it's under my impression that maybe they are getting high as well but maybe not like us the toads can live for a long time 10 years sometimes even 20 they say i have seen a special female here that has black markings on it i would see that one um, in following years so I know that they can live for quite a while. I've, I did see one toad get attacked once by a skunk. And the skunk had did some pretty good damage. The toad was bloody. But it was a deterrent and the skunk ran off. The toad survived. And I kept on my hike and went about. And later that night I bumped into the same toad again and it was alive still. I was impressed by how much distance it had covered they are really fast i have a video of one on the road you can see how fast it is they will be blinded in the light usually that's how i've oftentimes taken some really neat photography of them by using a light yeah, there's a lot of danger to the toads as far as the infrastructure with the roads. Toads are constantly getting hit out on the roads. They're drawn to the heat of the pavement. And they're crossing roads to get to other um, nature areas that they want to look for food or mating in. That's really unfortunate. They've also learned to evolve and adapt with cultures in the cities they find bugs underneath certain street lights. Of course, there is a growing interest in toad medicine. The cartel is even involved at this point. People are over harvesting with more information on the internet. More and more people are going down there and attempting to find some of this. So there is a larger pressure on them from humans in that way. And there's also the agriculture with the irrigation that's needed to grow anything down in the desert. The toads have learned that they can um, get access to water through these irrigation canals. But in addition to irrigation, there's also pesticides and fertilizers and chemicals that these farms are using, and they have a great impact on the toads as well. Their skin is warty and bumpy and their bellies are smooth they can really suck up a lot of moisture just through their skin so any kind of toxins that are in the water are also going to be sucked up into the body of the creature
this pamphlet came out underneath uh, the pseudonym of Al Most. Uh, Hamilton Morris tracked down the writer. His name is Ken Nelson. Uh, Ken passed away. He had Parkinson's at the end of his life. He was an amazing researcher, an activist, and a psychonaut, and was advocating for people to leave the toads alone. And as part of Hamilton's mission, he made a documentary on his show, Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, uh, detailing this toad medicine and Ken Nelson's life, and he met him before he passed. And Hamilton reproduced this, as well as some of the original artwork and t-shirts. All of the proceeds from this pamphlet go to the Michael J. Fox Foundation because of the Parkinson's research there and because of Ken's passing. I find that to be a wonderful synchronicity and psychedelic in its own right. It's kind of like a sign like, hey, I think you're on the right path here, mister. It's now also a part of my mission to advocate for us to protect the toads. There is an alternative is produced in the lab that is 99% pure 5-MeO-DMT. And I've had extensive experience with it. And I would say that it can take us to the same place and that we don't even need to put any pressure on the toads. 5-MeO-DMT is often called the God molecule or the crown jewel of entheogens. In regards to other psychedelics, comparing and analyzing, it's extremely different because it's super fast acting. The body metabolizes DMT when smoked within five to 20 minutes. That means a person can take one big lungful of this compound. It's like a rocket ship to God. You go zero to 60 like this. Ego disillusion, totally forget you're a human even. And then all of a sudden you're back in your body, your egos click back in fully. Other psychedelics like LSD can last for 12 hours. Ayahuasca is like a four to six hour trip. Um, psilocybin mushroom, same thing, four to six hours. So 5-MeO is similar to DMT in the way that it is processed in the body. They are very different. As far as the effects go, though, um, DMT, like what Terence McKenna had talked about so extensively during his life on Earth, is a very third eye activating compound, extremely visual. You're going to see all kinds of colors, maybe have interactions with machine elves. <laughs> I think a lot of the DMT realm is quite similar to the dream realm in that what you listen to and what you program your mind with might show up in your psychedelic journey. So that's how I believe DMT is working in association with the third eye. There's all kinds of things to compare and contrast and analyze in that realm because it's so visual and it's unpredictable. It's beautiful. I don't want to take anything away from it. I think it's an, an incredible molecule. 5-MeO, on the other hand, I compare it with a crown chakra activation. It can take a person into that non-dual experience. Non-duality has been a part of religious traditions across millennia. The Indian culture specifically is most fascinated with non-duality. In a 5-MeO journey, there isn't as much visual stimulus to compare and contrast it seems like everything is more crystal clear like super hd it is psychedelic it is it can be very visual for me but there's a sense of the ego moving from me 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 to we 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 to um, unity consciousness to feeling like you're connected with someone across the country that they're right here with you maybe even that you are them a connection with our creator. It's a profound mystical experience.
I've had great distortions of time and space on this molecule. For me, it's always been more about like an energy reset though. It's helped me with decision making. If I'm really stuck in duality, like should I say yes or no to this to this big decision? Sometimes I've used ceremony to get clarity and to ask for guidance. And oftentimes when I blast off into that non-dual experience, whatever the issue that was causing me so much thought and and weighing of options in that state of consciousness, it's just so simple and clear. It's just like, duh, why was I making such a big deal out of that? It's also helped me in my grief work with my father, like I said, just letting go, knowing that life goes on after death, that we're more than just our bodies. It's really helped me with my connection with nature. Uh, I always enjoyed doing it and sharing it in beautiful places, um, on mountaintops, with my back to a gorgeous white pine, you know, in the ocean, in the water. I think it's an incredible molecule for helping with inflammation in the body. John Hopkins had published a report in the American Journal of Drug and Alcohol Abuse showing that 5-MeO can reduce depression, alcohol abuse. Um, it can help with stress, inflammation, as I said. It can uh, stimulate neuroendocrine function, immunoregulation. It can also help with stress-related disorders like PTSD and addiction. With all that being said, I want to say that it's not a magic pill. I think that it's, for the most part, harmless. I've smoked more toad than I've smoked DMT. And uh, I, don't, I honestly, I think I'm better for it. I don't notice any kind of negative side effects on my physical body or my spiritual body. I liken it to a spiritual massage. It's like sometimes we need to go in and get our body worked on to release things. It's like an energy medicine, and I see people that would come. It's just like a reset button. It's like, oh yeah, life is beautiful, and I'm really lucky to be alive. You know, it's that button that I wish my dad could have hit. I think that it also opens the doors to other realms, though. You know, it can stir up a lot of trauma, a lot of memories. People with big egos might have a hard time surrendering. That's the ego's job, is to protect and to solidify itself. So the whole idea of letting go and surrendering into the unknowable and melting into it is really terrifying for some people. Michael Pollan, for instance, in his book, uh, How to Change Your Mind, he had an experience with the toad medicine that you can go back and read. It's a... Uh, it was horrifying for him. It felt like he was dying. For me, I've always felt like I was going to heaven or arriving home finally again. My evolution as a medicine practitioner is quite interesting in retrospect. I look back in the beginning. I was so blown away by this molecule. I wanted to share it with the world. At first, I had to share it with my friends and my family. And I had to get a lot of experience with the molecule myself. Um, in the beginning, I had a medicine partner who worked with me. She was into doing sound therapy with tuning forks. And um, it was really nice to have the male-female balance of energy. There was tons of benefits that came with that for both male and female clients. Um, I would say uh, in the beginning, I think we were doing too much though. What kind of came through in my evolution was like less is more. Not only with the dosage, but with the amount of involvement of the practitioner. I think there's different levels to these ceremonies. There's facilitators who are basically giving a person a hit and getting out of the way and holding space, keeping the area safe. And there's healers who are working with people that have issues or blockages that they want to release that really need help energetically.
I suppose in the beginning I was a facilitator. I moved into being a healer and an artist, a toad artist, you could say. I had a whole menu of offerings that I that I had available for people. The ceremonies looked all different. It just depended on who it was, what their intention was, if they were looking to explore consciousness or if they had some healing work to do. I would design a, a ceremony that would fit their needs. Typically, I worked with doing an initial consultation call, getting to know them, doing the health screening things, learning about their intentions, helping them to prepare, setting the date and the set and the setting. And then there was the ceremony itself. I like to work in nature whenever possible. I like to do multiple rounds, starting with the smallest amount and then a little more and then a large enough amount if the person was called to go for that full release. And then most importantly, doing a follow-up and connecting about integrating the experience. I think if a person goes on YouTube now and searches it, you're going to see different medicine practitioners serving 5-MeO. And some of these guys have served 10,000 people. They travel the world. Um, they're very busy. I could almost guarantee that they're not doing much integration work or asking a whole lot of questions about uh, medications or mental health issues or injuries. Um, and I, that's part of why I'm sharing this information and part of why I became the type of facilitator I was. I saw how important integration was and how much hurt was being done with psychedelics. There, there's money involved now. These medicines are commodified and practitioners can be a dime a dozen and not have a lot of training or experience. So, so be careful. You know, some red flags, especially with this medicine, some things I would ask if you were looking to have a facilitator, ask them what their approach is. You know, what's the set and setting going to look like? How long have they been practicing? Um, where do they source their medicine from? Will there be any aftercare integration? Those are some important questions to ask. Eventually, I moved into like a sliding scale type of a situation where I allowed people to pay what what they could. And that generally worked well for me. Um, it was never a big money maker, though. It was never really about the money. It was about helping people for me and exploring consciousness and wanting to see the world be a better place. I think that the people that I worked with received a lot of benefits. I saw... Yeah, I worked with a guy that had a pacemaker and he had, had a stroke and I watched his speech improve, his ability to articulate his thoughts improve. I've seen older people with a lot of inflammation in their body um, be able to walk really well again. Yeah, I've seen very depressed people open up and become happy and excited about life. I don't know if anybody out there recognizes this. This has been my ceremonial pillow for a long time. You may have laid your head on it even. <clears throat> yeah, it was amazing for me to get to do this. I'm so thankful to the folks out there that trusted me, that shared themselves so deeply with me over the years. And you know, the healer and the healed relationship is so powerful because we are all healers and really... What I found in the end was my job was to design or co-create an experience in a place that would be profound for the person that would journey and to guide them into this place and to bring them back safely and to open up the truth in them that they were healed and that they had the power inside of themselves. Some of my favorite ceremonies, 
started off as an idea that I had to experiment on myself with. For instance, I would float on my back while swimming in fresh water and my feet would sink. And I imagined how, how great it would be to have a couple of people float me. And then, of course, from there, I was like, wow, what if I did that while I was on 5-MEO? So I got a couple of my friends to help me do this ceremony. I had a wooden bowl that floats in the water and my tools. And I took my big hit and put it in, put my tools in the bowl and let it float towards the shore and then laid back and they received me and floated me on the water. And it was super amazing. I call that one the Bupo baptism. And I, after experimenting on myself and a few more trusted friends, I realized this, this is safe and beautiful. I think doing the toad medicine, especially in the water, is very powerful. That's where the toads come from. Without that water, there would be no medicine or no toads. myself you know standing in front of a mirror and uh, taking that hit and then all of a sudden the idea of the mirror disappears and there's just a human in front of you and then when you realize that it's you and your ego clicks back in it's like oh yeah ha. we got this uh, I found mirror work to be really powerful for self-esteem and self-worth issues, which so many of us have. Yeah, times when I wanted to ground, I would connect with a tree, put my back to a tree, and imagine those roots, the canopy above, taking in energy from the sun, energy from the earth, and I would just melt with that tree and become it in the ceremony i've got some car trauma from being in different accidents riding in cars i haven't always been the best passenger you could say i would rather be driving one ceremony i dreamt up was in a vehicle uh my friend has an amazing convertible and he took me up to this very windy road and and I journeyed and he drove very fast and I put my hands up like it was a roller coaster ride and I faced my fears. And in that state of non-duality without the ego getting in there and trying to protect itself and fight for survival, I was able to surrender. Um, it was really wild when my ego clicked back in. All the fears, all of the trauma memories immediately were back. And I was, whoa, 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 slow down. So that's what I want to say about this. I don't think it's a magic pill. So many people out there are talking about how 5-MEO is just the best thing in the world. And I think it's fascinating, but it's so powerful that it, like, traumas that are stuck in the body, deep-seated patterns, it blasts straight past that stuff. It'll take you into non-duality nirvana samadhi whatever you want to call it and then when you come back into your ego you know things might be great for a day for a week but those patterns they they die hard i mean a lot of times people are whether it's 5meo or the ayahuasca scene you know a month two months later they're they're right back to where they were sometimes it's even worse if they didn't have good integration or aftercare help or a community of support and like-minded people around them. So if you're someone with sexual abuse in your past, which unfortunately, as a medicine practitioner, I saw 50% of men and women that came in to do ceremonies have been sexually abused. It's way more common than you think. Be very careful about, about the doors you open when you have this kind of trauma. And I had a few clients that had some real demons I mean straight up demonic possession, energetic parasites. And as a healer, I had the power and the authority 
to stand in light and help them. I know that a lot of facilitators would be scared to death if they saw some of the things that I saw. And this topic is big and I want to discuss it um, specifically in a future video. But it's not always all love and light, ladies and gentlemen. Practitioners are pretty easy to find nowadays and medicine is readily available. There is the alternative to the toad medicine, which I think is even better. It's called Jaguar. That's the pure molecule. It's created in a lab. It was first synthesized in 1936. I think there's a lot of advantages to using it. No toads have to be harmed. It can be accurately dosaged and measured. You have to use much less of it because it's very potent. Toad medicine is 15% 5-MeO approximately, and then there's other things in it, other alkaloids. This pure molecule, you know exactly what you're getting. You can also insufflate it, snort it, um, by taking it through the nasal passage. It doesn't open for about 5 minutes, maybe 10 minutes, and then it slowly builds, and the experience can be 45 minutes, sometimes even an hour, depending on the dosage you took which makes for a little bit more of a gentle ride and less of a rocket ship into the cosmos. And that can be really nice for certain situations, for certain people. Personally with it, I think that the taste is different and the afterglow period, the reintegration of the ego, it's a little more clunky in my opinion, but I favor, I favored the toad because of my relationship with the creatures, because I held them because I protected them. Um, you know, I've always been that kind of guy that wanted to be involved in the process. The mushrooms that I took, I grew most of them. I learned mycology so that I could have them. The DMT that I smoked, I did the chemistry and extracted that DMT. Um, for me, I really love <clears throat> the journey, not just the destination isn't just my focus. Like, being present on the journey is, that's kind of what life's about, right? However, if the destination is non-duality, as far as 5-MeO goes, the synthetic version, the Jaguar, will get you there. No doubt about it. And I love the Toad, so I definitely support Hamilton's mission. And please leave those Toads alone. Martin Ball had put together this sort of anthology on facilitating 5-MeO. It's an approach to serving the God molecule. And he interviewed a whole bunch of different practitioners on the techniques they use and their reasoning for what they do. Fascinating. And then on this topic specifically, the Toad and the Jaguar. Ralph Metzner wrote this. And he has, had, I mean, he had a ton of experience with all of this. Check those out if you want to learn more. I think the best option out of everything, though, and I saved this for last, there's a way that you can have this experience without smoking anything. Endogenous DMT is a thing. Many of the people I worked with over the years would have reactivations. You know, a couple of days later, maybe they had a dream where it was like they smoked toad and they were on 5-MeO and they woke up just like, whoa, and they... We do integration work and they tell me about it. Like, Fox, I was there. It was just like I smoked it. I felt it all. And some people have even experienced that during the daytime with their eyes wide open. I'm one of those people. I've had reactivations so many times. It's, it's incredible to have that experience and to realize that we are the medicine, literally. That our bodies can produce that same effect. Some people can get there through breath work and meditation. Some people can get there through dark retreats. Some people are able to get there through sensory deprivation. Unfortunately, a lot of people are never going to experience non-duality or unity consciousness in this waking life because of the blockages and the habits that they have in their life. I see the body as an energy field and... Our habits, um, you know, the stress in our life, the diet, the booze, the smoking, the pornography, 
the traumas that we experience, all these things get stored and are a hindrance to this energy rising and the sacred secretion that we have in our brain from being released and experiencing um, God face to face. And I think that's what 5-MeO is to me. It's a mystical experience. It's a birthright for us to be able to connect with nature and to feel that oneness. And I think that's what our time here on earth could be best used for. It's the journey. It's the set and the setting of this trip. You know, do the work, release the blockages, heal the trauma, get rid of those bad habits, live a less stressful life, eat better. All of this is preparation for the ultimate shamanic journey, which is going to be death and your afterlife. Just like when you prepare to sleep at night, if you're thinking about your day and how stressful it was and all the things you did wrong and all the things that people did wrong to you, it's most likely that when you fall asleep and dream, you're going to have a nightmare about those things. You're going to have a dream that's stressful. You might wake up running in a cold sweat. And I see life through a psychedelic lens. I really think it's a great trip and that we're creating our reality in a lot of ways. And we can also live the dream way during night. We can prepare for our dreaming. We can live in a way that we have sweet dreams and beautiful dreams. And all of this is preparing us for the ultimate dream and when we get to leave these old avatars of ours and see the afterlife commune with with the one so in closing i want to thank the toads i'm glad that i got a chance to put this presentation together they've been wonderful teachers and i don't regret going down there and meeting them one bit but i realize now that i'm a healer and I don't need to use medicine in order to help people. In fact, I think I can help people more without it. It's a lot easier. Um, yeah, I've got fox medicine. Well, it's almost springtime here. The Healing Nature Trail will be open soon. I have a slideshow presentation available for psychedelic conferences and psych society meetings. I'm also available for doing integration work with people. If you want to talk with someone who has a lifetime of experience with it, contact me, send me an email, give me a call. We might be able to work together on that. So until then, be wild.